want to thank you for being with us this evening. And, and for those of you, oh no, that aren't joining online, I think we're down right now, right? But we're recording, so you'll hear this later. All right, so, um, you know, I just want to thank uh, the you know pastoral team and specifically uh, Pastor Omar for, for allowing me to preach here this evening. How many love your pastors? <laughs> Pastor Omar and Sister Lecky, it's amazing. It's a blessing in my life, mine and my wife's life. It's just, my life's been impacted by uh, the words of wisdom that God has given them as, as just uh, leaders in my life. And, and they're just amazing people. Um, I have a lot to go over today, but I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all of it. All right. But I, I want to be very, very clear that we are in Holy Week. All right. Some of you are excited about that. Some are like still wondering what that is. Uh, but this is a week where the next seven days, Christ begins to make his way to the cross. And then we see the resurrection. It's just a tremendous time. And one thing I started to think about, about this week is this week is celebrated unlike every continent. Christianity isn't a mistake. It's not an idea. It's the truth. And, and if you really think about it, there is everybody across this world is celebrating Holy Week. You can't say that about every religion. And I'm just so grateful to serve in this church, to serve the Lord. I'm so glad I found him and he found me. And so I, I, we've been in this series called um, Words from the Cross. But I want to speak to you tonight about words that came before the cross. And so... I want, to, I want to kind of want to start off, I mean, you know what, let's just pray. Let's just pray against every distraction. If you bow your heads with me this morning or this evening. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I ask that you would be with us, Lord, that your word would speak to us. Father, that it would not be my voice, but that your Holy Spirit would be louder than me. That you would bring revelation in this room. That you would illuminate your people. Give them fresh ideas, Lord. Bring conviction. Bring love, bring peace and comfort through your scriptures this evening. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So those of you that have been listening to me preach for a while, you know I like to start off every sermon with a story. So I got one for you today. And I really struggled with this because I, I'm like, I feel like I'm telling too many stories. But honestly, those you know who you are. Those of you have been coming up to me week after week. I love your stories. I love your stories. I love your stories. So I felt compelled to tell another one, and I think I've told this one before. All right, there was a moment, or, or there was a time in my life, my grandfather, he was alive. Uh, before he passed away, just like a year before he passed away, the family said, hey, your grandfather wants to go to Egypt, and nobody wants to go with him. I'm like, what the heck? What do you mean nobody wants to go with him? <laughs> I'll go with him. They're like, yeah, I know, that's what we're telling you. Can you go with him? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'll go with him. So... My grandfather, I start talking to him. I said, hey, you want to go to Egypt? He's like, yeah. I go, okay, well, why Egypt? Like, what? Let's go to Jerusalem. That's, it's better. It's, it's, it's nicer weather. It, it's just awesome. Let's, let's, just, let's go to Jerusalem. We'll see the Holy Land. My grandfather was a saved man. He, he served God. He ushered for like 30 years, and his Bible never closed. He's one of those guys. And so he just knew a lot. And he served in the church for many years. Um, and so I asked him, let's go to Jerusalem. He said, no, I want to go to Egypt. I want to go on the Nile. I want to see the Nile River. I said, all right, this is really weird. We'll go to Egypt and we'll see the Nile River. And so I planned this whole tour, everything, of this cruise on the Nile River where he could spend time. He said he wanted to go to the Nile River because... Moses was a baby floating on the river. Those were his words. And so I think about that. I'm like, what the heck? Sure, let's go, right? A little downcast and, and sad that I'm not going to Jerusalem at the time because I was saved. Um, I said, all right, let's do it. So I, I, we get on a flight. My wife's pregnant with, with our, our oldest daughter. And I brought my father as well. So we go to Egypt. And so we, we do this whole tour, and part of the tour, I said, I told the tour guide, I want to go to Muhammad's mosque. 
And this was kind of like a, a joke I had on my grandfather. And I said, um, take us to Muhammad's mosque. So we go to this mosque. Now this mosque is dedicated to Muhammad, not the prophet Muhammad, okay? But just this guy named Muhammad that actually protected Egypt and he's buried there. So we go and we're having a good time in Egypt, in Cairo. And that's where the mosque is located. And we're walking around there, we're barefoot. He was very unhappy about that. My grandfather did not like to be barefoot. So we're walking around this mosque and I could tell he's like a little irritated and grumpy, like, why are we here? And I'm kind of laughing at it. I'm, at, I'm having a little fun with it. You know, he's like, why are we here? And I'm looking at the mosque, there's kids running around, there's prayers going on, uh, but it's a beautiful place. It was a beautiful mosque. And so I finally, we finally get to this area of the mosque where it was kind of secluded and there was a tomb there and it said Muhammad's tomb. And it's, it, it really said Muhammad Ali's tomb, not the fighter, okay? This is the, <laughs> the political guy, okay? So it said Muhammad Ali's tomb. So my grandfather was reading it, so I whisper in his ear, he's in his grave. And he looks at me and he goes, that's right, mijo. He's in his grave. I want to remind you this week, Muhammad's in his grave. Buddha is in his grave. Okay? Ron L. Hubbard is cremated. But my savior isn't in his grave. My savior can't be cre cremated. His body was not found. I remember asking myself when I got saved, I said, how do I know that Jesus is the one? How do I know it's him? How, how come it can't be anybody else? Why is it Jesus? And as I begin to study the word of God and people begin to guide me in reading the word, I realized that it was through prophecy that we see that Jesus is the one. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, when the, Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true and exact words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him, the angel. But he stopped me and said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who have had hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God alone. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. His life and teaching are the heart of prophecy. See, if you don't understand one thing, understand that this was a plan. This wasn't by mistake that Jesus has a holy week. It isn't by mistake that every continent on this earth is going to be worshiping God and recognizing Jesus as Savior. This week is very holy. But what does it mean to you? See, when I started to unpack the scriptures, I learned about literary concepts like foreshadowing and prophecy. I like foreshadowing, foreshadowing as well because there's, there's a little bit of God's character found in it. See, we all like prophecy. We all like receiving a word. Like, prophet, give me a word. Let me hear something. My spirit has been dry. But even more than prophecy, we see God begin to act out his plan early on in Scripture. And I think about, what if God spoke to me every day? What if he spoke to you every single day? Some of you are like, well, he does, Pastor Robert. <laughs> he does speak to me every day. No, stop it. Okay? You're hallucinating. I sometimes ask God, how come you don't talk to me, but you talk to everybody else? What's going on here? And I realize that God tells me sometimes, hey, remember, you have to have faith in me. In other words, you shouldn't have to hear my voice all the time. I've given you the scriptures that will get you going through the days. But I understand if he began to talk to me every day, he would make himself real to me every single day of my life. My faith would be impacted that way. It would be easy to serve God if I heard his voice every single day. It'd be simple. Everything, if I had that relationship that Moses had with him, where he would hear his voice audibly speak to him and talk to him. Now, I know that we can, re we can get in the closet, the prayer closet, and begin to talk to him, begin to hear his voice and ask for him. But sometimes I talk to him and I don't hear anything. And I tell myself.
yourself, keep talking to him. Keep speaking. Because his word tells me to keep talking to him. His word tells me to keep worshiping him. See, I realized for God to speak to me every day would really undermine the whole concept of faith. It would dilute it. He'd be too real to me. That I would no longer have faith in him. What if he got quiet? When I heard his voice for every day, 364 days, and then 365th, I'd probably go insane. I'd probably have to get saved again. But that's what faith is. It's relying on him. But I had to learn that God provides regardless. He's a provider. Now, I talked to you a little bit about foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is an interesting thing because we see God kind of foreshadow Christ in, Abraham, in the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. I'm just going to paraphrase this story, but Abraham has to sacrifice his son. The Bible says very clear in Genesis chapter 22, his only son. Those of you that know that Sarah could not bear children, his wife, they tried for years to have a child. They were given a promise that through his bloodline that, that he would make a nation great, that, that the king would come, the king of Israel, that they would be establish a nation, and many nations would be blessed through the name of Abraham and through the bloodline. And so they couldn't have a child, so Sarah, as she was barren, you know, you have to understand that oh, Abraham then sleeps with his maidservant. It's just a mess. And this was written 1,400 years before Christ. But then God tells Abraham, hey, you know what? Get ready because I'm going to test you. Literally, that's what the scripture says in Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to test you. And so Abraham's like, here I am. He says, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. You're like, what? This is horrible. What an awful thing for God to say to Abraham. His wife was barren. His only son, Isaac. Everything that he had been wanting is in Isaac. Everything. The blessing of the Lord. And so Abraham, without questioning God, he, the Bible says he saddles up his donkey. He grabs two servants. And they go trekking along to the mountaintop of where he told them. And as they get to the base of the mountaintop, they're right there. Abraham suddenly says, stop right there. The servant and the donkey stay behind. Me and my son are going to go worship. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really be worshiping knowing that these would probably be the last moments with my son. I want you to picture and put yourself in the shoes of Abraham. As if, what is he feeling? What does that moment look like? What does that worship look like? That worship would probably be something very intense. But he says, I'm not going to be alone with the Lord. I'm going to bring my son with him. So he brings his son, and the Bible says they worship. They worship together. And so Abraham comes walking down this mountain with the servants. The Bible says he picks up the wood for the altar. And he puts it on the shoulders of Isaac, and now they're going to go up. So they don't take the, the donkey, they don't take the servants, they're going up the mountain. Meaning, Abraham's going to continue forward with the sacrifice. And so as he's there, Isaac, his son, begins to lay down the altar. He begins to place down the planks, lays down the altar, and he suddenly asks his dad, Hey dad, where's, where's the lamb for the offering? Abraham tells him, the Lord will provide my son. And in that moment, the very next verse, he begins to bind his son. He binds Isaac. That means he ties his hands behind his back. And he binds him. And he's going to put him on the altar. And as he puts him on the altar, Isaac sees the fire. The, the, he sees the fire. He sees everything taking place. Isaac willingly is probably looking at his father, and his father looking at Isaac. The Bible says he draws a knife. And as he's going to sacrifice his son, Abraham says, or God says to Abraham, stop, stop. He tells him twice, stop. And he tells him, 
Do not move forward with this. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me, your son, your only son. That story gives me chills. If you know the end of the story that God provides a ram, and they're able to now move forward with the sacrifice of this ram. And so I want you to understand the heaviness of this story. See, when Abraham reached the foot of the chosen mountain, he told the servants to stay back as he was going to worship with his son. See, the Bible doesn't say that he prayed. The Bible is very clear about this. When someone prays, it's mentioned prayer in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. He doesn't do that. He worships. This wasn't a conversation between Abraham and God. This was praise in the moment of trial. This is a concept that for some reason I even myself have a hard time grasping have a hard time understanding. This is one of those scriptures where I look at Abraham and I say, what kind of man are you? To hear from something that you don't see, to have faith in it, in a promise that was made to you and your wife, that you're about to kill Isaac. But it gets much deeper than that. It's not just Isaac that is about to get sacrificed, it's the bloodline. The bloodline was about to be severed right there. See, I believe that when Abraham was worshiping, he was giving God praise for something that's going to happen 1,400 years from then. He was worshiping the promise. In other words, the promise that was given to him and Sarah, the bloodline, that the nations will be blessed through one name, Jesus. He was worshiping that. He wasn't worshiping the circumstance. He wasn't even looking at it. He just knew for some reason. He knew that God was going to provide. The interesting part of, of the scripture is we see that Abraham, as he's worshiping God, he does it. He does it with his son Isaac, that God intervenes and spares the life of Isaac at the right time. And what I want to tell you is, I think Abraham at this moment understood the value of life with God in it. He wasn't thinking about his life without God. He knew that I'm different. God, my relationship with him is different. Therefore, I know that it's not going to end the way I think it's going to end. I've been made a promise. Therefore, the relationship begins to take priority over the circumstance. Are you with me this evening? How do you value yourself? Let me, ask, let me ask you this. Do you value yourself? Do you even value yourself? How about do you value yourself even though you're a Christian? Do you value yourself knowing that Jesus lives inside of you? Or would you value, value place your value the same way as if Jesus wasn't inside of you? See, when Jesus is inside of you, your value increases. Something is different about you. There's promises that God has made in the scriptures, prophecies that now live inside of you. So therefore, your value is more than you think. It's more than what you see in the mirror. It's more than, than what other people put labels on you about. God has placed a savior and a king inside of you. Therefore, your value is higher than you think. And this is what got Abraham through those moments where it makes it easy for him to worship because he sees value with that relationship. Do you see the same value that Abraham sees? Do you see that value? I told you that there's prophecies tied to this. I read to you the revelations where it says that Christ's testimony is a heart of prophecy. Did you know that there's 1,800 prophecies in the Old and New Testament, 1800. You know what I love about these prophecies? Here's my second point, that God fulfills all of them. Our God is a God that fulfills promises. He fulfills promises. We see it. Some of us have tested it. Some of us have experienced it. And you know what, these messianic prophecies, they were clear and they were concise. This is what I love. 
the Bible, especially the prophecies, they don't leave out details. They put them in. For example, this is a crazy concept. Now, you're probably used to it because you're all Christians that come to church. But in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. If I was reading that without the New Testament, I'd be like, why did they mention virgin? But you all know why they mentioned virgin. Because the last I heard is there hasn't been a virgin that has given birth other than Mary. So that makes something a little different about this God that you serve. The holy week that you're in. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Isaiah prophesies that Jesus Christ will come as a baby. And Jesus is described by several different names. In Micah 5 2, Micah prophesies that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. He would be a miracle worker. He would be killed for the sins of others. He would be raised from the dead. All these are prophecies written 1,500 to 600 years before Christ is born. These prophecies did not hold back. They told every little detail about it. I don't know about you, but I'm not much of a betting man. Some of you are. I know some of you are, I love the... The NFL, you guys place bets. Now, there's an educated guess that you could make in a bet. For example, if, you know, for the Lakers tonight, Anthony Davis isn't playing. I would probably bet there's a good chance that they lose. They didn't, by the way. But I would bet that there's a good chance that they would lose. That's an educated guess. But I would be wrong for that, based on the outcome. And so, but... The Bible really takes a shot here. The prophecies take a huge shot. They don't just say like, well, there's going to be a Savior and he's going to be born. No, he's going to be born of a virgin. Okay, well, he's going to be born. We don't know where, but he's going to be born on earth. No, he's born in a small town called Bethlehem. And, you know, there's even prophecies about that there's no room in the inn. We're talking that level of detail. I don't know about you, but I would be scared to make prophecies like that. Right? I, I would be nervous, like, oh man, I better be on point with that. <laughs> the other thing about the prophets is they were validated. They withstood the criticism geographically. In other words, they line up with the rest of history. They make sense that this person was alive during this king. That it lines up with other historical books, extra biblical books in the Bible, or outside the Bible. And so these, the prophecies line up. In other words, they've been tested. That means that there hasn't been a piece of archaeology that has been found to disprove any prophecy. Rather, it's always fortified them. Wow. Right. That's what's beautiful about the scriptures that are in front of you. Yeah. Is that they're timeless. They've withstood the test of time. The prophecies were true. Jesus dies, resurrects, defeats death. One of my favorite prophecies, and I know we just got past Palm Sunday, but I want to talk about this prophecy of Jesus in the triumphal entry, and it's found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and cry aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and able to deliver he is humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the offspring of a donkey. Now, a lot of people like to stop there, but I, I decided to go a little further for this sermon because this prophecy continues. In verse 10, it says, I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow for battle will be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from one sea to another. And from the great river to the ends of the earth. See, Zechariah was written about 520 B.C. So 520 years before Christ was born, Zechariah writes this. And we see that Jesus is about to fulfill this prophecy. This prophecy that says that he's going to be coming riding on a donkey. I don't know about you, but if I came to church on a donkey, you'd be like, who's this clown? <laughs> Right? Well, that's the guy preaching 
interested in. <laughs> like, I ain't listening to that guy. Coming on a donkey, no way. What's he going to teach me? Well, what does that mean, right? So the prophecy saying he's going to come on a donkey. Well, every king that we've seen kind of rides in on a horse. Believe it or not, it's a war horse. Because it's after battle. They've conquered their enemies, and they come in on a war horse. Or they come in on a chariot. Right? Because it's battle. But the scripture is specific that Jesus would come in peace. A little different. Not as dramatic. But he's coming in peace. He's riding in on a donkey. And the Bible, I've read it in several different translations. They use colt. A colt is a young male donkey. So it's not even like a full-size donkey. It's like a brand new animal that just came out. So it's like, why does my God, right? Why, good Lord, why can't we give him like at least a cool looking horse? You know, no, they put him on a donkey. And this prophecy, you're probably wondering when the people were reading it at the time, what, really, that's our king? Is he going to be buff at least? Right, really, he's going to come in on a donkey. How's that going to look? How's that going to work? And so what Jesus says is you're going to see him fulfill this prophecy and, and some historical context here, Jesus had provided, he already had started providing a lot of miracles. So people started to hear about him because he was, you know, healing everybody. He was healing the lame. He was, he was you know, deaf, you know, deaf people can now hear and the blind can now see. And Jesus is doing all these miracles in this little area. It's like two inches on a map, maybe even an inch on the map of Galilee. Real tiny area. But people begin to follow him. He has this following, and the Romans are like, you guys hear about this Jesus guy? He's like, he's like, he's like doing miracles, and you know, that's kind of, that's kind of, we don't like that because our God Caesar is going to be upset, and all our kings are going to be upset if he continues to do miracles. So the Romans are like, well, I don't know, we we got to work with these people, these people, and we got to make sure that they're happy. So let's just work with them. So Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem which is a Roman province at this time. The Romans were in control, but they allowed the Jews to go ahead and run it, and the Pharisees. And so they're like, Jesus is about to enter this area, and I want you to catch Jesus's, as I read to you our main text, Luke chapter 19, verse 28, I want you to catch Jesus's reaction. It says this in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Verse 32, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked him, why are you untying this colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So they followed directions like all of us should, right? The Lord needs it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Verse 38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I don't even have to preach to you guys. I just read scripture with you. You guys are getting me excited. Verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. 
They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You can go ahead and put that picture up. Someone said good word. It's his word. Amen. It is good. There's a picture of Jesus coming in. You guys know I like art. No, I don't own any. Maybe I should start thinking about that. Because I love this stuff, man. I'll just stare at it for hours sometimes. You can see all these holy people. These are his disciples. Okay, the pe people behind him, the ones that are following Jesus, you'll see the halo around them representing holiness and following their teacher, Jesus. You see Jesus? He's in a <laughs> peace. Check this out. That's not what that is. It looks like that. But I'm going to teach you something. In this form of art, this is very common, Jesus would be palm out like this. This is not me saying peace, but it's blessing you. Okay? Though he's coming in peace, that can be misinterpreted. Please put the picture back up. I'm not done. I'll let you know when to take it down. Thank you, production team. So he, they thought that was my main point. Sorry. I'm having fun up here, so if you're not, if you're upset, I'm sorry. So, listen, he's coming in on a donkey, right? You can kind of see that there's some people that don't have the halos on them, right? People kind of talk in here. You'll see people, like, kind of looking at him, like, what the heck? He's on a donkey? You know, which side would you be on? Keep that picture up. Zacchaeus? This is cool art, isn't it? This is pretty cool. Zacchaeus was just, he had just had his story with Zacchaeus in the scriptures. So the artist put that in there. Pretty cool. Okay, so, by the way, art validates the Bible. I don't know if you knew that. Ancient art validates the Bible. Okay, it's, it, so it's very important. That's why I show it to you guys. I'm not just doing it because, you know, showing off or anything. This is... I, I, when I started to see art in a religious way, it really started to impact my life. And, and so when I, look at, when I look at this, I think sometimes we could be right here at church. Jesus begins to weep. You can go ahead and take that picture down. This weeping part um, is, is hard to understand for me because it's, it's called... The triumphal entry. But what's the triumph? As I begin to study this, God is beginning to triumph over opposition. But it's not physical opposition. It's not wartime opposition. It's not heavy opposition. It's probably some of the worst opposition you can be in front of. It's people denying him. So when he begins to weep, it's because of what was said to him. Keep your disciples quiet. Tell them something. The Pharisees, his own people in Jerusalem. Are you going to say something to your disciples? And what does he say? He says, if I tell them to stop, the stones will cry out. As he begins to weep, I don't think it's a normal week that we've ever probably experienced. As I try to put myself in Jesus' shoes, which I do frequently, I, I probably shouldn't, but I try to understand what he was feeling because I believe he's 100% man, 100% God, a hypostatic union, every, I believe in all of that. And as I try to put the humanity of Jesus, as I try to put that on me and see like, why is he crying? Because people are laying down their clothes on the floor. People are praising him. But it was just the few that began to deny him. And that was enough to make him cry, to make him weep. See, the Bible says that, and the history tells us that after seven days, the people that were praising him, saying Hosanna, saying all those things, the people that were praising him are going to be the ones saying crucify him. In seven days. 
in seven days. So I began to research what, 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 what made them do this. And so as I began to read the triumphal entry in different parts of the New Testament and all the Gospels, I came to this simple conclusion that it's honestly he begins to weep because of the prophecies. He begins to weep because he knows what's going to take place in seven days. He knew that he was going to be let down by everybody and he's going to put the world on his shoulders. The other thing he's weeping for is because people were worshiping him, and many were. And then many will, will begin to crucify him, the same ones that were worshiping him. The reason for that is it was simple. They wanted him to rescue them from Roman rule. They wanted a political leader. But Jesus is coming. No, I'm not here to give you a political leader. I'm here to bless you. I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to die for you. I'm here to do this for you. I'm here to heal you of your sin. What happens when Jesus doesn't follow your narrative, church? What happens, I want you to ask yourself this, when he doesn't give you that miracle? The miracle that you say he needs to give you. The miracle that you pray for. What happens with your relationship with him? What happens to that relationship? Does it get stronger or does it get weaker? What side are you on? Francis Chan said this, people don't want to be free from their sin. They want to be free from the penalty of their sin. See, we expect God just to bail us out. Bail us out of sticky situations. That we put ourselves in and we get upset when he doesn't do things our way. I'm here to remind you that Jesus isn't here to rescue you from financial stupidity. He isn't here to get you a better job. He isn't here to get you a better career, a prettier spouse, a better car, a better or more government. Jesus is not here to fulfill our wants, but rather his needs. Church, we are here to fulfill his needs. We are in debt to the Savior. And when he's weeping like that, it's because we act like we don't need him sometimes. See, he's already saved you. There should be some change. You should start believing in him and start to act and change your ways. See, all Jesus wanted was for us to accept the gift that he made for us. One thing I love about the prophecies is it tells us that our God is unchanging. Our God doesn't plan to change. Our God will not change. No matter what social media you follow, no matter what news outlet you hear, our God cannot and will not change. And I say that humbly. I understand that we get caught up in political and woke movements. I understand we like to condemn those that aren't like us. But what I'm here to tell you is we need to work on ourselves because our God is unchanging. Stop worrying about everybody else. Start working on yourself so you can share the gospel with others. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The crucifixion. What the, men, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. Death, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. In other words, Satan, as he was trying to destroy the whole plot of Jesus, he thought he was doing it. The Pharisees, the Romans, they thought we got Jesus right where he wants, right where we want him. We're going to crucify him. We're going to take him off this planet. We're going to kill him. How ignorant were they if they would have read the prophecies they fell right into the power of God and the will. See, even when it, with Jesus, this is what I love. With Jesus, even though it seems like we're losing, we're really winning. When I think about Holy Week, I really do think about an amazing week, a week where my Savior won. But in those moments... Do you know that it looked like it was it? And that's why people turned away from it? 
They thought it was over. This is it. He's going to be put on the cross. He's going to die. He can't be the one. He can't be the one. You know, really, it was their ignorance that put them in this situation. The fact that they couldn't even understand the prophecies. My biggest fear, church, is not understanding the word of God. It's one of my biggest fears. It should be yours as well. See, because it, when we don't understand God, we, we go from celebrating Jesus as the king and then looking at him as a crucified criminal in seven days. See, I don't want to be that person that worships on Sunday or Holy Week and then rejects his purpose for my life. Because I understand that there's something greater that God is trying to do inside of me that can make an even greater impact in this world. I hate that I can worship him and then doubt him moments later. As these people began to see the miracles of Jesus, even us, we celebrate it. We say, yeah, God's doing a miracle, amen. But is it really doing anything inside of you? Or do we want some political hero? John chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He came that which was his own, that which belonged to him, his world, his creation, his possession, and those who were his, his own people, the Jewish nation, did not receive and welcome him. We need to be in a, a position to welcome our Savior. See, the, we have to remember that we too, we can't be so caught up in our spirituality where we say, Oh, I'm good. I'm never going to abandon the Lord. I'm going to be honest with you. I think when you start to say things like that, you start using that as an excuse to not come to church, not worship, not read, because you think you're too good. I've already experienced enough God that I can't lose the salvation that he's given me. I could never turn my back on him. Right now, you probably can't, but in seven days, you might. We too, in the same breath, can honor him, but also dishonor him with our actions. When I ask you this, and I want you to really be honest with yourself and think about this question, what will it take for you to deny God? I'm staying quiet because I want you to think about it. What is it going to take for you to deny God? The reason why I'm asking you this question it's because I want you to fix that. What is it going to take for you to deny God? Some of us are saying, I, I, I want to see miracles. I want to see him. You know, I want, I want to see God active and alive. And he's already active and alive. You know, how many more miracles do you need? You know, Pastor Omar says, consistently says, it's a faith that is not tested. It's a faith that cannot be trusted. We also have a value that we need to define and align. See, it's easy to worship when you are aligned with Christ's will. It's easy, just like Abraham did. He was aligned. He understood his value. And then he understood it even more, knowing that God was with him. It was easier to worship with him. Have you defined the role of Christ in your life? If you've defined it, have you limited that? Because Christ, once you allow him to take over your life, everything begins to change. See, I'm here to tell you, you don't need another miracle. You don't need another prophecy. You don't need more documentation. You don't hear to, need to hear it on the news. You don't need another YouTube video. You don't need another report from a scientist. You don't need another sermon. You don't need a perfect circumstance. You don't need more answers in your life. You just need Jesus. When you know him, you have his word, and then you have everything. Everything. If you would just bow your heads with me.